goodness me, third time. Um, uh, my name is Dr. Simon Elliott. As Robert said, a best-selling author, a best-selling and award-winning author. And you had me at a very good moment with this particular book, the one on your screen, Roman Britain's Missing Legion, which was law. Well, I, I, it was published in February, and within about a week became an Amazon number one bestseller um, in the world, actually. Um, and got a lot of publicity with features in the Times and the Daily Mail, a lot of regional newspapers, um, BBC, uh, Radio 5, and television, etc. Because this is an enduring story. It's one of the great historical mysteries of all time. This is a legion which disappeared. It's the only Roman legion which we don't know its fate. So that's 5,500 men who go down some kind of Mary Celeste route completely disappear from history and of course caught the popular imagination um in the 1950s onwards through Rosemary Sutcliffe's amazing um Eagle of the Ninth book and subsequent Hollywood movies etc which I'll touch on actually because mm -hmm. a large part of this story is historiography and just to point out that the book actually uh, he's a historical detective story so I'm not saying from the word go what I think happens and then trying to convince the reader I'm right. Actually, what I do in the book, and you'll see it in the presentation, is I follow all the major hypotheses through to their end game to try and work out what the chances are of that one being correct. And then only in the very last line of the very last page do I actually give my opinion. And then only in the context of if you, the reader, or you, the viewer today, or the listener today, or um, want me to tell you what really happened, then I'll tell you what I think really happened. But, but very much this book will allow you to work out your own conclusions simply because I set out all the facts and the various hypotheses from the past. Um, and as Robert said, if if you, everybody can make sure their, their audio is turned off, that'd be fantastic. So on the front cover here, you've got my book, um, which Robert very kindly told me last week, so I didn't know, had been shortlisted in the BBC History Magazine's top 10 books of the year uh, and nominated as such by no less than Andrew Roberts. So goodness gracious me and since then it's gone back to being a number one bestseller on amazon again so so that was very auspicious robert thank you very much for letting me know um and on the right hand side you've got um the the an, a, a bronze eagle which is in the silchester collection at reading museum which is an amazing collection in a fantastic museum go and see it if you have not been before uh which was found um excavated in the the the, the basilica actually uh, of silchester and at the time rosemary sutcliffe wrote the eagle of the ninth was thought to be the aquila eagle of a roman aquila standard this is the most important standard of a roman legion actually it transpires it's not actually it's a wingless decoration from um, some kind of frieze in the basilica but at the time this was thought to be the eagle of the ninth um, so that's my starting point okay robert next slide please so today I'm going to talk about historiography, which is very important here. Remember, this is a detective story. And then I'm going to talk about chronology. So I'm going to tell you the hard facts that we know about the Ninth Legion. As always with my presentations, most of the slides are pictures I'll talk to. One or two are wordy and the chronology is wordy, literally because I go through every known fact about the Ninth Legion. Um, I, I wish there were two, by the way, to confuse us. Um, then I'll talk briefly about Roman Britain in the first and second centuries, given its importance to the first two hypotheses about what happened to the Legion. Then I'll briefly talk about the Principate Roman military. So the Roman military of the first half of the Roman Empire, within which sits the story of the loss of the Ninth Legion or the disappearance of the Ninth Legion. And then I'll go through the four hypotheses I cover in the book. So one is lost in the north of Britain. One which is new in the book is lost in the south of Britain. One's lost on the Rhine or Danube and one's lost in the East. And then I'll, I'll have a conclusion and give you my opinion. But remember, it's only my opinion. Um, the facts are in the book and they will enable you to draw your own conclusions, which may be just as valid as my, my, mine is. Um, next slide, Robert. Start off with a pretty picture. So this is the popular image of what happened to the Ninth Legion here. We can see the Caledonians in the far, the unconquered far north of Britain. Remember, the, the far north of Britain, could uh, the Romans only attempted to conquer it in full strength twice under Agricola in the uh, late first century AD, uh, which is the subject of a, a new book, by the way. I'm going to be writing next year, hot news for you, Agricola in Scotland, a generation defining volume about Agricola's amazing campaigns in the far north of Britain. And then also uh, under Septimius Severus, which is covered in my book, Septimius Severus in Scotland. So this is the popular image of what really happened to the Ninth Legion. Um, next slide, please, Robert. 
So firstly, let's look at the historiography and we'll begin with the primary sources. And we're very fortunate here that the Ninth Legion is covered in depth, actually, by a wide variety of primary sources. So Julius Caesar in his Conquests of Gaul uh, and, and other works covers the, the, the story of the Ninth Legion. Um, Paterculus uh, covers the Ninth Legion. Plutarch covers the Ninth Legion. Tacitus covers it in detail, very important. Suetonius covers it. Appian covers it. Cassius Dio very importantly covers it. So does Herodian, uh, and it's also covered in the anonymous Historia Augusta, and then later by the Latin chroniclers. Of those, the most important for us are Tacitus and Cassius Dio, in my opinion. Next slide, please, Robert. Um, so, so let's begin now with the, the the near contemporary and contemporary histories. So you have the the ancient sources. So we'll now come to how the story of the lost Ninth Legion comes to us to this day. And this begins actually with the antiquarian historian John Horsley, who in 1732 published his book, Britannia Romana, the Roman Antiquities of Britain. Now, in this book, he's the first person, which is an amazing feat of, uh, of, of literary work when you think about it, to, to track the histories of all of the legions who fought in Roman Britain when they came, when they fought, and when they left. And it's he who first notes that there's no reference to when the ninth legion, Legio Nine Hispana, actually uh, left Britain. So he's the first one to note that actually we don't know what happened to the ninth legion. And then if we jump forward to the, the middle of the 18, uh, 19th century in the 1850s, we, we come across this world-renowned, the world's leading scholar, the German Theodor Monson. He's the leading global scholar on, on, on the Roman world at the time. And he publishes this huge multi-volume um, as wide as my Mac, um, History of Rome. Um, and it's he who takes John Horsley's um, reference to what, there being no knowledge of what happened to the Ninth Legion and starts putting flesh on it. So he comes up with his own hypothesis and he says that the Ninth Legion is lost in some kind of uh, uprising in Brigantian territory. So that's broadly Britain north of a line from Chester to the Wash all the way into the Scottish borders. And it's a catch-all term, Brigantes, for the tribes of the north, um, certainly in the way it's referenced today. So he, he says that there's some kind of insurrection with the Brigantes in the north of Britain around the time Hadrian becomes the emperor in 117. And within this insurrection, the Ninth Legion is wiped out in its legionary fortress in York. Now, here we first get knowledge of one of the key things, which is an issue for the historian looking at the um, story of the Ninth Legion, because although it's a very plausible hypothesis, there's no evidence for it. And there's certainly no evidence at all now in the archaeological record to date that there's been any kind of um, demolition event in York at all, let alone at this time. Uh, but this is this this hypothesis begins to take hold in the popular imagination. If we jump forward over a century, next slide, please, Robert. Uh, oh, actually, no, we'll go back to John Horsley first. So just to give you some, it's all right. Go for one, Robert. It's fine. That's it. So uh, just to put some flesh on bones here, that's the amazing map that John Horsley put together for for. Um, is Britannia Romana. You can see how high quality this is for an antiquarian historian at the beginning of the 18th century. And then we'll move on a slide, please, Robert. That's the terrifying Theodore Monson. <laughs> so <laughs> that imagine my surprise when when I was putting my deck together, and this is the image of this 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 um, 19th century Ger German scholar. So there's Theodore Monson with the histories of Rome. We move forward again, one, please, Robert. So the whole thing comes forward, the 120 or so years, and we're now into 1952. So Theodore Monson's idea about the Ninth Legion being lost in the north, in his case, in a, an insurrection in York, of which there's no evidence, has now taken hold not only in academic, but the popular imagination. And Rosemary Sutcliffe in her 1952 Eagle of the Ninth, which is a beautiful book, um, I've, got, I've got two very worn copies. Um, she, she takes Monson's core hypothesis and built her narrative about what happens to the the ninth legion of the eagle of the ninth and in her idea idea and the the, the the book her ninth legion is lost fighting in the far north of britain in the con unconquered north so in her book the ninth legion had left york marched up deer street to the northern frontier and then marched across remember there's no hadrian's wall at the time but it's still broadly along the line of the solway firth tyne um, marches over the frontier into the scottish 
borders and then it's somewhere there or above um in the the the, the, the lowlands of scotland uh, the ninth legion is lost that's a broad hypothesis and then if we jump forward again please robert and then that comes all the way through to to um, our millennium where we have uh, in 2010 and 2011 sequentially two hollywood blockbuster movies here's channing tatum in the eagle and you also have michael fassbender in the centurion T two hollywood superstars have retweeted a tweet i've made actually one of them is channing tatum who retweeted a tweet when i tagged him for the launch of the the ninth legion and um russell crowe also retweeted one of my tweets when my Septimius Severus in Scotland and Pertinax book came, books came out as well. So, so that got me quite a bit of attention in Hollywood. Um, and, and so the story comes through to us to this day, where in the popular imagination still, the story of the Ninth Legion is firmly embedded in this lost in the North narrative, of which I, I have to tell you, there's not a lot of evidence. So if we go forward again, please, Robert. So now what I'm going to do is go through the chronology of what really happened to the Ninth Legion. This is putting together everything we know from history and archaeology. These are the hard facts. OK, and from these hard facts, I'm going to extrapolate two or three to highlight the end game of the Ninth Legion. OK, so the, the, the original Ninth Legion, there were two. The original Ninth Legion um, was probably founded to take part in the social war. Um, in the um, uh, early AD 90s, okay? So it's founded to take part in the social war. And it continues in use being an elite legion all the way through the sort of um, late Republican civil wars when you get Marius and Sulla fighting each other. And here then we have Caesar um, having the Ninth Legion as one of the core four legions at the beginning of his Gallic conquests. So the Ninth Legion plays a key role in the, the story of Caesar's conquest of Gaul, certainly takes part in the 54 BC incursion to Britain, later participates in Caesar's later civil war campaigns in um, Macedonia and Greece, in um, North Africa and in Spain. But then for some reason, before Caesar's assassination in 44 BC, it's disbanded. And when it's disbanded, it disappears, only to reappear a year later. So we don't know what's going off here, but the original um, the original uh, Ninth Legion is, is disbanded before Caesar's assassinated. And then it's refounded after the assassination by Octavian and then plays a full role in the later civil war, the very end game civil war campaigns of the Roman Republic, fighting with Octavian. Um, so it fully participates, for example, in the Battle of Philippi, where uh, Mark Antony uh, and um, uh, where Mark Antony, did, uh, Octavian and Mark Antony defeat Cassius and Brutus, and it performs so well it gets its first cognomen. So the first cognomen for Legio Nine, the, Le the Ninth Legion, Legio Nine, yeah. and Legio Nine, the second yeah. one. Could you turn your mic off, please, somebody? Um, is in the context of this battle, the Battle of Philippi, and it doesn't become initially Legio 9 Hispana, it becomes Legio 9 Macedonia. So already this new reformed legion is an elite legion. It then takes part with Augustus, Octavian is now Augustus, in the Cantabrian Wars in the north of Spain, and it performs so well that it becomes, um, it gets a new cognomen, so it changes from Macedonia to Hispaniensis. This later is shortened to Hispana, that's how we get Legio 9 Hispana. So it begins as Legio 9 Macedonia, then Legio 9 Hispaniensis, and finally this second ninth legion becomes Legio 9 Hispana. Okay, next slide please, Robert. Moving on, it's then deployed to um, Aquila in northeastern Italy around 10 BC, and by AD 14 has been deployed to Pannonia, so um, the western Danube, uh, Danubian region. And it's one of the three legions in a given legionary fortress, of which we know no name, which mutinies. So there are a number of themes that come, start, begin to come through here. To this point, the Ninth Legion has been elite, an elite fighting legion, but then over the next sort of century, things begin to go wrong, as you'll see. This is the first thing that goes wrong. It's part of a mutiny, and it may have had a decimation um, inflicted on it to bring it back to heel. But by AD 20, it's back to full fighting strength again because it then, um, for a short time, gets deployed to North Africa to support Legio III Augusta against the Numidian rebel leader Tasfarinas. 
uh, and participates in a major victory in AD 22, after which it then gets deployed to the legionary fortress uh, Sisak in modern Croatia. Could somebody turn their mics off, please? I can hear someone making a cup of tea. Thank, thank you. Um, and then from Croatia, it finds its way back to the Danube, and it's there um, when in AD 43, it, it joins Aulus Plautius, who at the time was the governor of um, Pannonia, as part of the Claudian invasion of Britain. So it's one of the four legions which invades Britain, and it's actually uh, Plautius's own legion, given it's the one that comes from Pannonia. And then from 44 to 49, it plays a key role in the breakout campaigns in Britain, which I'll illustrate in a minute. Uh, and then in 6061, it plays a minor role and a very negative role in the Boudican revolt. So this is the second piece of bad news associated with the Ninth Legion when uh, it's based in uh, Lincolnshire because as part of the breakout campaigns, it was the Legion which of the four at the time. Uh, I'm sorry, Simon, I, I, I someone's muted you. I think we're having a bit of. Uh, uh, lots of people have joined. I'm I'm very sorry. Uh, we started at, uh, at quarter to one, but please do not mute our speaker because otherwise we won't have a talk. Uh, the mic's back on. Can you hear me all right? Yes, that's good. Right. So so um, the Boudican revolt. So, so when Boudicca begins her revolt in the North, in North Norfolk in AD 6061, the nearest legion, probably in South, South Lincolnshire, is the Ninth Legion. And so as Boudicca's column uh, approaches Colchester, um, the Ninth Legion, or at least vexillations of it, so not the whole legion, just units of it, along with its legate, Serialis, who's later a very successful gunner in Britain, by the way, but that's much later, um, tries to intercept the Boudican column and it doesn't get to Colchester in time. So Colchester is sacked and the, the Roman column with vexillations of the Ninth Legion and its legate Serialis then intercepts it afterwards, but is defeated to the extent where Serialis actually runs away with his cavalry and then spends the rest of the Boudican revolt hiding in a nearby fort. Um, the, the downside there is that all the legionaries all the legion which, he, which he left were killed. So this is, again, a negative story. So the first time we see it uh, engaged in a major confrontation, which is given historical detail to us, it's defeated. So we see the revolt in AD 14 in Pannonia, which is a negative thing. And then here it loses this first engagement under, in, in the Boudican revolt. Um, next slide, please, Robert. Um, and then after the Boudican Revolt, it then takes part in the Agricolan campaigns in the far north of Britain, um, where it performs pretty well, except that here we have the third negative comment in AD 82, because Tacitus tells us that in a given engagement somewhere in Scotland, uh, as on a given evening or night, it's building its legionary fortress, the uh, natives of the far north of Britain attack and nearly overrun this fort or, or marching camp. And while they're doing so, uh, Agricola has to intervene and only just saves the Legion from being wiped out. Um, so they have the third negative historical reference to the Ninth Legion. So up to the AD 14, it's an elite Legion. But then you start seeing these negative things coming in. This one in AD 82 is very, very important because this is the last time the Ninth Legion is mentioned in history. OK, that's a very important date. Um, then we think it was engaged in the Battle of Mons Graupius, but we have no detail about what it did. And we know the auxiliaries did most of the fighting so in that battle. That's in the ground. Uh, no. answers. Why would you have to ask great questions? Was that Robert? Apologies, Simon. Uh, if I can remind everyone to mute themselves, please. Um, and so they have the Battle of Mons Graupius. And then at some stage between AD, um, AD 104 and AD 120, Simon, you're on mute. Is that better? 
Yes. Can you hear me, Robert? Yeah, that's better, oh, Simon. Yeah, Thank it's you. happened again. But, uh, I will keep going. <laughs> Not sure why it keeps going on mute, Robert, because my cursor's nowhere near the mute button. No, I think someone has... There's a there's an option to, to mute all. Uh, but please don't do that, because all it all it means is we're just missing out on on listening to Simon. Do, you, do I need to go? Which bit do I need to go back to, Robert? I wouldn't worry about that. OK, <laughs> I, so, I think we're up to uh, is it AD 104. 104, yeah. So we have a vexillation deployed to Nymarg, which I'll cover off later when I do the third hypothesis about what happened to, to the Legion. Um, then in AD 108, we get the next key event in terms of what happened to the Ninth Legion, which is the last time it's mentioned in epigraphy. And this is um, uh, the, the, the inscription above uh, a gateway at the Roman legionary fortress in York, which at the time was being rebuilt in stone. So the first things which were rebuilt were the gates. Go back one, please, Robert, which, which were the gates. And um, we have an inscription which references this gate was built by the Ninth Legion, and it's dated very accurately to AD 108. That's the last time it's mentioned in epigraphy. So the, the last time it's mentioned in history is AD 82. The last time it's mentioned in epigraphy is AD 108. And then that's it. It's not mentioned again in writing at all. Jump forward to AD 122 when we have the arrival of Valigio VI Victrix, which replaces the Ninth Legion in York when it accompanies Hadrian to Britain. You also have in the AD 120s Hadrian's War being built, where all the units which helped build it left inscriptions, but there's no reference to the Ninth Legion. And very finally, in AD 168, there is two columns built inscri inscribed in Rome, which list on them all the extant legions of the day. We know that's accurate because it lists legios 1, 2 and 3 Italica, which have just been formed by Marcus Aurelius to participate in the Marcomannic Wars. But it doesn't list legios 1, 2 and 3 Parthica, which were in the early third, in the very, very late second century, uh, recruited by Septimius Severus to fight in his eastern campaigns. So this column is very accurately dated and lists all the legions which existed at that time. And there is no mention of the Ninth Legion on the pillars. Next slide, please, Robert. So I'll read this. Of these hard facts, five are the most important regarding the fate of the Ninth Legion, namely that it is last mentioned in literature in AD 82, in inscription in Britain in AD 108. It was replaced in York by Legio VI Victrix in AD 122. There are no inscriptions referencing it on Hadrian's Wall, and it is missing from the Colonetta Maffei pillars in Rome, dating to AD 168. And this is just reflecting what I'll cover off later. The legionary tile and brick stamps from Nyamargan are also important, but the dating between 104 and 120 isn't tight enough to be especially useful. Next slide, please, Robert. So just to reflect, and this is important later, often people don't think that the legions of Rome, certainly auxiliaries, yes, but the legions of Rome don't jump about hugely. But you can see on this map of the Principate Empire, this is at the time of Trajan. Um, you can see there because he's got his eastern conquest on, on, on the Principate em Imperial map with the provinces. The Ninth Legion has jumped about a lot in what we know, let alone what we don't know. So we know that um, it's for, it was founded to fight in the social wars, the first one. We know that it fought with Caesar in Gaul. We know it fought with Caesar in Macedonia and in, um, in, in North Africa and in Spain. We know it was deployed to Italy, to northeastern Italy. We know it was deployed to Pannonia, see Pannonia right in the middle there. We know it went to Britain. So this is a legion which actually does jump about quite a bit. Um, so that's worth remembering that when we go on to the later hypotheses about it being lost on the Rhine and Danube or in the east. Next slide, please, Robert. And here, just to cover off what it was doing in the campaigns of conquest uh, in Britain. So the red arrow, bottom right, this is the arrival of Plautius with uh, his four legions in AD 43. And then we have the breakout campaigns for the next 20 or so years. So the yellow lines in the Midlands and into Lincolnshire, and then the green line into Lincolnshire, and the blue line into North Norfolk, that would be broadly the Ninth Legion at the same time as an example where Vespasian is leading the Second Legion into the South. Southwest. Next slide, please, Robert. Uh, and this is just an important map to set in place where the Ninth Legion was based in 
broadly the province of Britain as it appeared towards the end of the first century AD. So it's based in York. So it's the Northern Legion. So other legions were based elsewhere in Britain by this time. But the Ninth Legion is the Northern Legion. And it's the legion which would have deployed most of the troops or more troops than the other legions in Britain to the Northern Frontier because it was the closest one to them, which is obviously the mindset of Theodore Monson in the 1850s through to Rosemary Sutcliffe and others. Next one, please, Robert. Um, so Roman Britain in the first and second centuries AD to give context about the first two hypotheses. Firstly, note that throughout the Roman occupation of Britain, it was very much to my mind, the wild west of the Roman Empire. You're, you're at the farthest edge of the empire, certainly in the northwest, and you're across terrifying Oceanus. The province is always heavily militarized because the far north is, is never um, fully conquered. And later in the empire, after the Ninth Legion's time, it's obviously a hotbed for usurpers for those reasons. And there is a clear divide, I think, between a militarized north and west and a more settled south and east. So broadly a line that goes from, let's say, the Seven through to the Humber. Um, uh, and the important thing for us there is that the militarised zone in the north and the west, that's where the Ninth Legion sits in York. Next slide, please, Robert. And if you want to get a sense of what the Romans really thought of the Brigantes and the peoples of the far north of Britain, I refer you to this amazing piece of sculpture, which is in the uh, museum in Corbridge, um, which was originally a mausoleum um, decorative um, sculpture, later became a fountainhead and is in the museum there now in Corbridge. It's absolutely beautiful. It's very, very big, by the way. And, and there you have the Romans clearly are on the top and the native Britons of the far north are on the bottom. That's what the Romans really thought, I think, of the, of the Britons in the far north. If you want to get into the mindset of the Ninth Legion. Uh, next one, please, Robert. And these are the classic Vindalana tablets, which tell you the same story. You have this amazing use of the word Britain Cooley in there to, to describe the filthy little Britons of the far north. So there's no love lost between the Britons of the far north and the Romans, in this case, with us, the Ninth Legion, which gets you into their mindset when we later look at the hypotheses. Next one, please, Robert. So, so the Ninth Legion, let's look at the, very briefly at the Principate Roman military system. So what was the Ninth Legion? How did it fit into the wider Roman military before it disappears? Well, the Principate military system of which the legions of the time were based is, was introduced by Augustus, formalised around legionaries or auxilia, which are lesser troops but still very good, and the, nave, the regional fleets which were created by Augustus. So broadly, you have 30 legions of 5,500 men, down to 27 after Varus loses three uh, in Teutoburg, uh, Teutoburg Forest in AD 9, but later increasing again, maximum number is 33 under Septimius Severus at the beginning of the uh, third century AD. Uh, and then 10 regional fleets and then multiple auxiliary units, which include all the cavalry units as well, or most of the cavalry units. Uh, it continues the century based system of the Marian legions, which are the ones that were used by Caesar and on which the Ninth Legion was originally based. Um, and in by the early Principate legionaries, uh, including those of the Ninth Legion, served for 25 years, were paid 225 denarii a year. Uh, this was doubled by the time. Severus' son Caracalla became the emperor, but at the time of the Ninth Legion, it's 225 denarii a day. Um, you had to be a Roman citizen to be a legion of the Ninth, a legionary of the Ninth Legion. Um, they were paid a pension in terms of money or a stipend uh, when they retired, and this system lasted broadly until the middle of the, of the crisis of the third century, in the middle of the third century. Next one, Robert. So. Uh, Within Britain, how did this fit sort of at the time that the Ninth Legion is lost at the end of the first beginning of the second century AD? Well, in Britain at the time, at this time, you have three legions. You have Legio II Augusta at Caerleon, Legio XX Valeria Victrix in Chester and Legio IX Hispana in York. Um, so Legio IX Hispana is the Northern Legion. Um, uh, some of the staff were seconded to be beneficiari um, to serve with the governor and procurator who are based in Britain. And in actual fact, if you look at the two legionary tombstones you see in the, the modern Museum of London, these are both beneficiari who were seconded uh, in that case from Legio II Augusta and Legio XX Valeria, Valeria Victrix from Caerleon and Chester to serve on the staff of the governor in London, hence them being buried in London. There was an equivalent number of auxiliaries, so you're looking at between 30 and 40,000 troops in Britain, and you have the classic Britannica regional fleet. Next slide, please, Robert. And there you go, a very good Peter Connolly um, image of what the uh, uh, Roman Principate Legion would have looked like. 
So if you want to have a think about this legion, the Ninth Legion, the Lost Legion, how many men were involved? Well, it's that. That is what disappears from history. Next slide, please, Robert. Uh, and here you can see the popular imagination, the classic appearance of the Principate Legionary, probably as many of the legionaries of the Ninth Legion would have looked in the later first century AD. Here you've got the fine Lorica segmentata at banded iron armour, which broadly, broadly had replaced Lorica hamata chainmail by, by the later first century AD. You've got the scutum um, body shield, you've got the pilum lead weighted javelins, you've got the gladius hispaniensis sword and the pugio dagger, so, and, the, and the imperial Gallic helmet. So this is broadly the elite warrior of their known world at the time. Next slide, please, Robert. And it's worth remembering how these legionaries fought as well. So we see them as using the pilum, but actually the principal weapon was actually the gladius hispaniensis, which was which because uh, because effectively they, they were elite swordsmen with a very specific fencing technique. So if they had the opportunity, their preferred method of fighting was to loose their lighter pillar when you're about 40 meters or closer to um, the enemy force you're attacking to disrupt their ranks. Remember the pillum, lighter and heavier, has a long iron shank. And if it hits the enemy's shield, even if it doesn't kill the opponent, it will disable the opponent because it will bend on impact on the shield and make it very difficult to wield. So you loose the, the lighter pillar as you approach. The heavier pillar is then thrown at point blank range, after which you draw your gladius hispaniensis, which is, a, by the way, remember it's worn very high up and on the right hand side by the legionary. So to draw it, you have to pull the pommel down and then flick it out into the guard position you can see there you then take the enemy's blow on your shield and then stab him in the midriff if you're going under or in the upper torso if you're going over you will note with the gladius hispaniensis it is a particularly brutal weapon because it has no blood runnels so there are no channels on it to allow air to go into a wound and to allow blood to come out of a wound so it sticks so the legionary, who, by the way, is built like a middleweight Olympic weightlifter, square and all muscle, has to give it a massive twist to get the weapon out, causing a terrible gaping wound. The Romans used this sword for about 500 years, and they never put blood runnels in, so it means they knew what they were doing. So in actual fact, not only is it a brutal physical weapon, this is also a psychological weapon because your opponents knew what was coming. It's like a sort of a Ju-87 Stuka in the Second World War where it's screaming dive. It will terrify an opponent even before you fight the battle. Next slide, please, Robert. And there you can see exactly that technique in use by Trajan's um, legionaries fighting the Dacians with the blow of the Dacian Falks going on to the Scutum. And then there the Centurion ramming the um, ramming his Gladius into the midriff of the unfortunate Dacian. Next one, please, Robert. Uh, but also remember these legionaries, the Ninth Legion's legionaries and all legionaries of the Principate were elite engineers as well. They were all trained engineers. Next slide, please, Robert. Uh, and they carried all their kit on their back. So they had to build everything. They built their marching camps. They carried all the kit on their back. So they were nicknamed Marius's mules after the original Marian legions because effectively each legion was a self-contained unit which could move very quickly because the legions carried everything on their backs. Next slide, please, Robert. Then you have the, the auxiliaries, who are the lesser troops, but also still very good. The, these auxiliaries are fighting in one of the Ju uh, Jewish revolts. And then the next one, please, Robert. And finally, you have the, the regional fleets, in this case, the Classus Britannica in Britain. This is, um, this is um, a, a really beautiful image, actually, from used to be displayed in Dover Museum called the Dawn Patrol from Dover. And you can see this uh, group, this, this this squadron of three Liburnia galleys deploying from Dubris, the Roman port of, um, of Dover. Next slide, please, Robert. So let's look at the hypotheses, OK? So we'll go through the four. So the first one, based on Monson in the 1850s through to Rosemary Sutcliffe and subsequent Hollywood movies, is lost in the north of Britain. Next slide, please, Robert. So let's let's have a look at what we're talking about. This is a really brilliant image, actually, quite easy to find online of Roman York, which is the the York which the Ninth Legion would have known. So north of the River Ouse, there you can see the um, legionary fortress, uh, where the modern minster is effectively built right in the middle, on top of the uh, Principia and Praetorium, which were the centre buildings of a Roman legionary fortress. Um, the legionary fortress, the Ninth Legion would have known, wasn't stone built 
apart from much later the gates the original one they built remember the ninth legion founded york as well as lincoln it was actually built with a ditch and bank with a palisade on top it's only later it then gets fortified and built of stone into the uh, first uh, second century ad so there's the legionary fortress where the ninth legion would have stayed and then go south of the river Ouse, and you have the canaba civilian settlement go back please robert you have the cannabis civilian settlement, uh, and if you want to get your your, your sort of light, your your, your eye, eye line in, uh, where the bridge is, that's probably the same bridge today, the route of the same bridge today. The modern railway station, railway museum, is the top left hand side of the Canaba there. Next one, please, Robert. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now is this key piece of evidence which we have from York. So we do know the last time that the legions mentioned in epigraphy is in 82 BC, sorry, AD 82 by um, Tacitus in the context of the legion almost being wiped out uh, when its legionary uh, marching camp is attacked overnight as part of the northern campaigns of Agricola. Um, we then move on to AD 108 and we're in York and we have this inscription. And the inscription which is erected above the new stone built gateway as the stone fortification begins to take place at the legionary fort in York. The inscription says this, it says the Emperor Caesar Nerva Trajan Augustus, so this is Trajan, son of the deified Nerva, conqueror of Germany, conqueror of Dacia, so it's post his Dacian campaigns, chief priest in his 12th year of tribute, tribunician power, that gives us the exact date 108, acclaimed Imperator six times, built through the agency of the, this this piece of stonework was built through the agency of the ninth this man of legion so there we go that's it that's the last time in 108 the legion is mentioned anywhere in writing okay move on please robert that's what the gateway would have looked like so the inscription would have been right above the, the center of support between the two gateways next one please robert and that is it. And the beauty is that you can go and see it today. Next time we go to York, go into the wonderful Yorkshire Museum, you walk through the entryway, you go past the ticket desk, you go into the atrium and in front of you, you have that virtual display. You have the lovely map of the Roman Empire on the floor. Look above the virtual display where you have the CGI images of um, Romans in York, look above it, right above it, and you will see the actual piece of epigraphy. It's right there, that very piece. It's right in front of you. Next one, please, Robert. Um, now, what could the context have been then if the Legion was lost in the north? Well, this is the Historia Augusta uh, talking about Hadrian. When Hadrian took over the empire, he reverted to an earlier policy, devoting his energies to keeping the peace throughout the world. The people subdued by Trajan had rebelled the Moors were launching attacks, the Sarmate, the Sarmatians making war. And here we go, the Britons could not be kept under control. So we have at the accession of Hadrian, um, trouble across the Roman Empire, which is actually well referenced. Uh, he wasn't expected to become the emperor. And also was, when Trajan died, he was a long way from Rome. So word reaches the far northwest of uh, the, uh, the empire, for example, in Britain, quite late in actual fact. That, um, that Hadrian's become the emperor. And you can imagine them saying, who's this guy? Um, so there's trouble in many places across the empire, including in Britain. But we have another piece of evidence of how this manifested in Britain. Next one, please, Robert. So, and I'll read this. Uh, we have evidence of a specific emergency expedition sent to Britain in AD 117 at the time Hadrian became the emperor. So we have a tombstone from Italy which records Titus Pontius Sabinus, who's the primus pillus of the uh, Legio III Augusta. So let's run that through first. Primus pillus is the senior centurion of a, of a Roman legion, which means within the legion he's the fourth in charge, and also he's the senior fighting man in the legion. So this is not your sergeant major as most people would see a senior centurion this is a very very senior officer okay and he's from legio three augusta so he's from the legion which at the time was based in north africa okay uh, and he's the guy who's appointed to command the expedition to britain and we know from the that from his tombstone which lists all the details that he was given command of Legio Seven Gemina, Legio, sorry, a vexillation, so that's a thousand men from Legio Seven Gemina, 
Legio 8 Augusta and Legio 22 Primaginia. That's a total of 3,000 men from the northern limes and from Spain who were sent to Britain. 3,000 men, that's almost a legion, remember, sent to Britain in 117 because there was some kind of emergency in Britain. And they were sent not to the south, but to the north. They were actually sent directly to South Sheep. South Shields on the Tyne and deployed onto the northern frontier. So, question, there is clearly some kind of serious interaction in the north around the time Hadrian becomes the emperor. It requires almost a legion in strength to be deployed uh, with an elite soldier in charge to help steady the ship, whatever happened in the north. Could this be the context for the disappearance of the 9th Legion, Legio 9 Hispana? Uh, bearing in mind it's the Northern Legion based in Lincoln and then at this time York, last mentioned in 108, so this is going through to 117, it's almost a decade later. Um, and these troops stay in Britain and through till almost 120 and maybe even later. So something happened in the north of Britain at this time. And we do know that at this time, there's no reference to the 9th Legion. Next slide, please, Robert. And we also have coins minted by Hadrian after this event to declare that there have been success in Britain. So he calls himself Britannicus. Now, interestingly, this coin is very important in British history because this is the first time that you see uh, an image of Britannia appear anywhere. This is the first Britannia. You can see it here, actually. And the Britannia we recognise today from later Roman coins and the modern image is, uh, is an image based on Minerva Victrix, so Athena. So it's Britannia is a warrior. And here, Britannia is a warrior. She has a shield. And she has a spear, but she's looking quite thoughtful, isn't she? And maybe, maybe the thoughtfulness reflects the fact that there'd been an event in Britain and um, there'd been this need to deploy an emergency um, reserve to Britain to steady the ship. Next one, please, Robert. Um, and then you may have more trouble occurring in the early 120s again, because we know that Hadrian visits Britain in 122, not only bringing a new governor, but also bringing a brand new legion, which replaces the ninth legion in York, which is you would not at this point in Britain with the size of legionary fortress have had two legions there. It's not big enough. So the sixth victrix comes over and replaces nine Hispana. So something's happened between 108 epigraphy and 122 Hadrian arriving. And the event we do know happened in the historical event is this emergency deployment to reserves to the north of Britain. Next slide, please. And it's Hadrian, of course, who builds Hadrian's wall. Next slide, please. Uh, and I won't go into detail about Hadrian's Wall. Next slide, please, because I've got some lovely pictures of it and more detail. So there's an amazing image of Hadrian's Wall. Now, remember my point that all the units which built Hadrian's Wall from 122 into the later 120s um, left inscriptions to say we was here, but there's nothing from the Ninth Legion. So they, to my mind, they weren't here to participate in building the wall. Next one, please. And again, you can see the line of Hadrian's Wall there. Next one, please. And that is an, one of the inscriptions on Hadrian's Wall to give you some uh, an example of what one would look like. This is actually um, from the uh, granary of the fort at Benwell near Newcastle, uh, where we have an inscription of the Classis Britannica, the regional fleet. So even the regional fleet is being deployed to build parts of Hadrian's Wall and its forts. So if the Ninth Legion had been building it, it would certainly have left an inscription somewhere, but it didn't. So it didn't participate. Next one, please. Should add in my opinion. Um, so this is the last slide of Lost in the North. If it was Lost in the North, the Ninth Legion, what could it have been? Well, the the the, the theories you could look at are number one, Third Old Monson, destroyed by the Brigantes in an insurrection in York. Number two, Rosemary Sutcliffe, lost in the far north. Or number three, a combined theory where you have a region-wide conflagration of the kind we get with the Boudicum Revolt, where everybody joins in and the legions just uh, they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And then perhaps the reason why it disappears is because it performs so badly. It has a memoria damnatio given against it to wipe it officially from, from history. So that is lost in the north. Let's go into lost in the south. Next one, please, Robert. Um, and... The two images here are important because on the top left, you have Roman auxiliary cavalry. I'm just telling you this, but not why yet. Roman auxiliary cavalry recruited even into the early empire were in the West, mainly from Gaul and Germany, 
where historically there'd been uh, a culture of headhunting. It's very relevant. And then here on the bottom right, you can see the Cripplegate Fort in Roman London next to the uh, Museum of London and Barbican. I'll tell you why that's relevant now. Next slide, please, Robert. Because we have a new theory, and the new theory, and I'll say where it was in a minute, is called the Hadrianic War in London. So there is a new theory which ties together three pieces of evidence to suggest that at the time Hadrian became the emperor, there was some kind of major event which took place, a negative event in London, and it's called the Hadrianic War. And the three events are the finding in the archaeological record of about four or five hundred decapitated crania, so the top part of the head, in the Walbrook Valley and the tributaries of the valley dating to the 110s and 120s. So if you look at the map on the right of Roman London, the Walbrook stream bisected Roman London in half. It's the blue stream right in the middle. Um, on the right of it, you can see the Basilica and Forum, the Grey Square. On the left of it, top left, you can see the Cripplegate Fort. Okay. So that shows you the, the war block stream bisecting Roman London in half. Then later you get the, the, the Severan land wall built around the lot, but this is before that took place. So this is the London at the time Hadrian, or just after actually, as you'll see, Hadrian became the emperor. So where you have those red dots in the upper reaches of the Warbrook, which is right on the edge of the boundary, the religious boundary of Roman London, that's where you have these hundreds of heads being found, okay? Then you have an event which we do know uh, is very strongly indicated in the, the historical record, the Hadrianic fire, probably in the 120s at some stage, or maybe the late 110s, when you have Roman London burnt down for the second time after the Boudican conflagration. But this Hadrianic fire is actually very interesting because the majority of fires are known to have been started at the front of the buildings as they move onto the street. So it's the street fronts being set alight first. So it looks like it's a deliberate torching event. And that's the whole of Roman London burnt down. And then finally, in the later 120s, you get the Cripplegate Fort where the Museum of London is today, being built on the top left of Roman London. That's the square top left on the map, the other side of the Warbrook. Um, and tying all those three things together, the theory goes that the skulls come from some kind of major beheading event of some kind in the context of an insurrection in Roman London at the time Hadrian becomes the emperor. Then you have the Hadrianic fire, which is part of the same event. And then later the Romans come back and they build the Cripplegate fort as a means of putting their stamp back on the city saying, we're not going away, we're still going to stay here and we're going to actually double down. Next slide, please. And this isn't a fanciful theory, it's actually from Britannia, from um, um, somebody I know well, um, uh, uh, Professor Dominic Perring of UCL, um, and uh, he's one of the principals behind Archaeology Southeast as well. And he wrote the first piece about this in uh, Britannia in 2017, and he calls it London's Hadrianic War. And as you will know, Britannia is the most esteemed of academic journals, peer reviewed, and here we have this theory set in stone. So it looks as though academically we can prove something ha happened at this time in London. Next one, please, Robert. Uh, that is a great image of London just after the Cripplegate Fort are being built. So you can see here the grid pattern has been put back in place and the buildings uh, are now back in place and the Cripplegate Fort was built. But broadly, if you ignore the Cripplegate Fort at the top, that's what uh, Hadrianic London would have looked like with the Basilica Forum in the middle. You can just see the other side of the built area you can see the, the Warbrook Valley extending to the north of the Cripplegate Fort. Next slide, please. And there is, uh, there is a, an interpretation from the Museum of London of the Hadrianic fire taking place. Next one, please, Robert. And there you can see the Cripplegate Fort, the Vexillation Fort, built uh, after the event to put the stamp of the Romans back on London after the Hadrianic War of whatever form it took. You can see here, it's an absolutely classic Roman vexillation sized fort for up to 2,000 men at the maximum uh, with a Principia and a Praetorium in the middle, et cetera, and all the barrack blocks. So this is a full fat Roman fort, a militaristic fort. Next one, please, Robert. So what could the events be that would have led to the Ninth Legion in this context being lost in the South? So I'll read this. And I go through all the detail in the book uh, and then I'll come to a conclusion at the end of the presentation. The Ninth Legion in this context is the legion that rebels around the time of the accession of Hadrian. It's not unknown. 
for legions to rebel, as we know. Um, and then this rebellion is put down by headhunting auxiliaries, hence the beheaded skulls being the um, defeated legionaries. Or the Ninth Legion is wiped out trying to defeat a rebellion against the accession of Hadrian in AD 117. And in either case, the Warbrook scores are those of the legionaries, if this hypothesis is true. Next slide, please, Robert. And there are some of the Warbrook scores. Now, here's the interesting thing, just to add some value. Some of them have already been um, scientifically examined to look at where they may have originated from, looking at particularly at teeth um, to show where the individuals may have grown up. And they're not Romano-British. Of the few that have been examined, they're from North Africa and Spain, which intriguingly are the two key recruiting grounds for the Ninth Legion. So only a tiny piece of evidence. I'm talking to a TV production company at the moment, actually, about going uh, as doing a mainstream um, television program to actually examine what might have happened, where these scores are from, because we can, with the, with the number we've got, which is a lot, we can actually do a proper scientific analysis, which may end up as a mainstream TV, TV uh, program. And I've just finished filming a program which is going to appear in the spring for Netflix called Life and Death in Roman London, where uh, I, I participated as the presenter and I participated in some autopsies of Roman skeletons. Um, and you can tell an awful lot scientifically now from a skeleton. So if we were able to examine these skulls uh, scientifically, we could really actually get a really clear picture about where these individuals came from but to recap of the few that have been examined they come from spain and north africa move on please robert lost on the rhine and danube so the picture you can see there is the roman legionary fortress so this is a fort for five thousand men uh, at nymargen um, next one please robert so there's Nymargen right in the centre of the picture. It's in it's in uh, the territory of the Batavians, um, so in the Rhine Delta, uh, and it's right on the front line, as it were, of the Roman limes on the northern frontier. Next one, please, Robert. And you can see here where Germania Inferior is, within which sits Nymargen. So so you can see again, it's right on the frontier in the northwest of the Roman Empire. Next one, please, Robert. There's another image of uh, the, the fortress at Nymargen, which is called Novi Omegas Batavorum uh, in Germania Inferior, as we know. Next one, please, Robert. And the evidence of the Ninth Legion here comes in the form of tiles, um, which played a key role in my PhD um, theory. And I find myself, even in my office now, surrounded by pieces of Roman tile. I love, I love, I love Roman CBM. And here you have from Nymargen around 100 um, around 100 tiles, mostly tegular, so it's the flat roof tile, uh, um, and a few imbrecs, which are the curved roof tile. And these have stamps of the Ninth Legion, which is intriguing because um, the way nine is spelt on the, or is laid out on the stamp, is only used. Um, in Roman tiles in one other place in Roman Britain. So most of the time, the tiles are stamped with Legio 1X9. But here on these Nymargen stamps, they are Legio V1111. And the only other place where tile has that stamp in Roman Britain is at a small Roman fort in Carlisle. So here, what you may be seeing is a vexillation of Roman legionaries. So that's up to a thousand men being deployed from the northwest of the northwest of the Roman frontier zone, so Carlisle, for a time between 104 and 120 to Nymargen. And there's one other inscription, which is on a mortarium mixing bowl. Next one, please, Robert. So what's the context? Well, the legionary fortress at Nymargen was originally home to Legio Tengemina. This was called away around 101 to serve in his two dating campaigns through to 106. So vexillations from other legions pulled together, just like the emergency deployment to Britain, but here in Nymargen, to replace the legion, which uh, the, the 10th legion, which went with Hadrian. This almost certainly included the 9th legion. And then the emergency deployment to Nymargen definitively ended in 120 when Legio 30 is known to have deployed to Nymargen. So between 104 and 120, it looks like 
some troops from Nine Hispana were deployed as part of a conglomerate group of legionaries to hold this part of the northern frontier. But crucially, I don't think it was the whole legion. Next one, please, Robert. And here we can see the two contexts where the Romans may have deployed the Ninth Legion north of the Rhine or Danube and where the fighting was so sanguineous it may have been lost. The first one is the Dacian Wars of Trajan. Next one, please. And the next one is, oh, here's Maximus. Uh, the next one is uh, the Marcomannic Wars of um, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Ferris and later Commodus. There is no mention at all anywhere of the Ninth Legion being deployed in either campaign. And we know nearly every unit which was which fought in both campaigns. So to my mind, that mitigates against the Ninth Legion being lost on the Rhine and Danube. Next one, please, Robert. The final hypothesis lost in the East. Move, move, move on, Robert. So the three candidate conflicts being lost in the East are all very, very sanguineous campaigns when the Romans lost a lot of troops. So Trajan's Eastern campaign, the 114 to 117, which was successful in that he got to the, 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 the shores of the Persian Gulf. But on his way back, um, heavy handed Roman uh, control of the various Hellenistic cities, certainly in Parthia, sparked off what's called the Kittos War, which in, later became the Second Jewish Revolt, which was a conflagration across the whole eastern Mediterranean when the Romans had to deploy a lot of troops to put down the revolt across the whole of the eastern Mediterranean, particularly in Alexandria. Then you get the second potential candidate for the, the Ninth Legion being lost in the east. This is the Bar Kokhfer Third Jewish Revolt from 132 to 136, when a Roman legion was lost, but we don't know its name. And then finally, we have the Roman Parthian War in 161 to 166, um, when at the beginning we definitively know that a legion was lost, because when this war began, um, uh, in 161, when Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Ferris replaced Antoninus Pius, Vargasis II, who was the Parthian king, decided to, to make merry on the eastern frontier. So he invaded Armenia, which at the time was under Roman dominance. And so the Roman governor of Cappadocia, which is the, the, the eastern bit of modern Turkey in the Zagros Mountains, and the northern part of the Roman eastern limes, um, the governor there, Severinus, decided that he was going to make a name for himself by taking an unnamed legion with him to put this invasion by the Parthians of um, Armenia down. So he leads the legion into Armenia and it's wiped out by the Parthians and he commits suicide. So a legion is wiped out, but we don't know its name. And it's certainly not one of the two legions which the Romans usually deploy in Cappadocia because they continue happily on towards the end of the Roman Empire, um, certainly towards the, the 500s. So an unnamed legion is wiped out there as well. Next slide, please, Robert. So let's look at some pretty pictures. So there is the Parthian Empire. You can see Armenia there sort of just above the Parthian Empire. So this is where the campaigning took place and you can see Cappadocia to its left. That's in Trajan's Eastern campaign. Uh, and then it's also relevant when we go to the Roman Parthian War in 161, 16, uh, 161 to 165. Next one, please. And here we can see the Parthians. This is a lovely image because it tells you all you need to know about them. They are very, they were a very difficult opponent for the Romans to fight because nine tenths of their warriors were mounted horse archers and the Romans at this period, including of the Ninth Legion, were heavy infantry. Um, then you have one tenth of them being these shock cataphract, fully armored man and horse cavalry on the left. So it proved a very difficult opponent for the Romans to fight. Next one, please, Robert. There we can see the, the map of the uh, Principate Empire again. So our campaigning theater here is on the, uh, the right hand side. Um, next one, please, Robert. And here we can see um, fighting in the, the, the Ketos War and also the third Bar Kokhba Jewish Revolt. So this is a Roman legion fighting a very difficult campaign here, in this case in a built environment. And we, we do know a Roman legion was lost. Next one, please, Robert. Here is the story of that specific legion in the Bar Kokhba campaign being lost, being ambushed at the very beginning of the campaign. But again, it's an unnamed legion. Next one, please, Robert. And finally, just looking at um, in terms of this third bar cockfer revolt, it's worth remembering that, of course, Hadrian thought this 
conflict, the Third Jewish Revolt with Bar Kokhba as the Masonic leader, was such a tough fight that he was absolutely brutal in the way that he put the the, the Kingdom of Judea, the province of Judea, and the Jew, the, the revolting um, uh, Jewish warriors down. He really, really went to town um, uh, in the way that he defeated this revolt. Such was the scale of the jeopardy faced by the Romans in the East. Next one, please, Robert. And finally, we have the Roman Parthian War in 161 to 166. And this is an image of the legion, of the unnamed legion. Ignore the fact it's been given the Legio II, an unnamed legion being defeated by, this, in this case, Roman Parthian cataphracts. Almost certainly what you would find is the legion would have been on the march in mountainous Armenia, trapped in a plain somewhere by um, um, Parthian horse archers who bombarded it in, and, and gradually inflicted casualties. Roman uh, vexillations or smaller units would try to break away and chase the, the horse archers away. And as soon as the Roman formation becomes disrupted, the shock cavalry charge in and wipe it out. So let me get rid of this phone call. There we go. Uh, next slide, please, Robert. So conclusions. So what I'm going to do now, remember what I've said about the book. The book is a detective story which follows all the hypotheses. And this is the very end of the book. And I'm going to read it to you. And remember, this is an opinion. The key point here is everybody has an opinion about the fate of the Ninth Legion. And this is mine. But please do your own research, read the book and come to your own conclusion. So in the book, I say the following. Ba this is the, la the end of the book. Based on the hard and other facts set out above and my wider knowledge of the Roman world and military, the least likely candidate hypothesis regarding the fate of Legio 9 Hispana is that it was lost fighting on the Rhine or Danube. There is simply no evidence that anything other than a very specific vexillation spent some time in Mar Nymargen and then the evidence trail goes cold. The next least likely hypothesis to my mind is that the Legion was lost in the east in any of the three scenarios examined. Of these, the most likely candidate would be the Ninth Legion being the one lost under Severinus at the beginning at the start of the Rome Parthian War. However, I feel the chronological gap between it last being referenced in Epigraphy in AD 108 in York and the massacre in Armida in 161 is just too lengthy for there to be no record of it in the intervening years. Moving on, Perring's Hadrianic War in London has to be considered a serious candidate event in which the Lyons Legion met its fate, perhaps with the Damnatio Memoriae subsequently wiping it from the official record. However, given the plentiful analogous and anecdotal evidence, I actually think the most likely hypothesis regarding the loss of the Legio 9 Hispana is where the book began. This is with it being lost in some dramatic event in the north of Britain. I would say there, by the way, that the gap between the third hypothesis, the east, and lost in the south of Britain is very close. So that was a tough call to make, where lost in the north of Britain is significantly to my mind ahead, but that's only my opinion. The reality of course, this is the last line of the book. The reality of course is that unless some fantastical new piece of evidence emerges in some long lost contemporary history, or through the discovery of one of the archaeological finds of the century, we will never actually know the fate of the Ninth Legion. Until then, based on what we do know, the above is where the available evidence ultimately points. The Legion was lost in the north of, north of Britain. Next slide, Robert. That's me finished. There's the Ninth Legion book. Uh, I'll take any questions you've got for me, Robert. I've got about 15 minutes. Well, you, well, you managed to uh, um, run through that, uh, um, and as I say, I think this is a classic example where uh, we have to buy buy your book and make up our own minds. I think on this one, uh, I, I look forward to watching uh, your uh, documentary and see if you get some new evidence. So, uh, Chris, I see you got your hand up. Uh, if anyone else likes. Would like to ask a question please put your hand up yeah uh thank you for that uh, very interesting talk uh, my question is perhaps a bit of an obvious one if the legion was lost in anything resembling military glory wouldn't they surely have written about it which then suggests that if nothing was written about it whatever they were involved in was shameful therefore it's could be the uh, lost in the south um, hypothesis that went through. It, it, whatever happened to it, it was shameful because it lost. 
So if it was lost in the north, lost in the south, lost in the Rhine or Danube, or lost in the east, it lost. So, yeah, so how, I, how have I you cut think, it? I don't think losing is shameful in the world of the military. I think it's a, re a rebellion or a mutiny or something like that, surely. Losing a battle is not shameful. It might be regrettable, but it's not shameful. Good, good, good point. Well made. Thank you. Next question, please. All right. Who would like to ask? Uh, we've got uh, Paul. If if the uh, knights, if the ninth Legion was defeated in the north, who would be the most suitable victors? Would be the Picts or the Scots or no? The the Picts are much later. So the peoples of the north, there are various. The Romans broadly called the peoples of the north for the most of the Principate, the Caledonians, within which the various geographers list a wide variety of tribes all the way up to the the the, the very far north. Um, but broadly, someone like Tacitus would call them the Caledonians, but it broadly means one of the tribes in the far north. It's only later you begin to find, probably through contact with the Roman northern frontier, by the by the end of the second century, well after the time of the Ninth Legion, I think, that you end up with two specific confederations mentioned, the, the Caledonians, but in a different context, this time as a confederation, and the mighty A. And then from the late uh, third century, you get the, the Picts being used as a term. But, but at the time, it would have been one of the tribes or a number of tribes who the Romans broadly would have called, if it was north of the border, uh, the Caledonians. Uh, so we have Chris and then Graham who put the hands up. Yeah, uh, hi, can I uh, just ask the question, what um, evidence would Horsley and Momsen have had uh, in order to sort of investigate, would, would it just have been purely archaeological record? No, mostly, mostly, um, mostly historical texts. Would that have been Tacitus? Uh, yeah, or, or any of the ones which I mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, I, I gave you a whole list of about ten at the beginning. The Ninth yeah. Legion is actually well referenced, just we don't know what happened to it. But most of the legions which fought in Britain, especially because they're so well covered by Cassius Dio and Tassius and others, um, we know most of the detail. So only much later you start getting the archaeological record, in particular with epigraphy, playing a more significant role. And actually, archaeology now is playing an equal role to history because in the last twenty years, certainly in the far north of Britain, we've begun to be able to map out where a lot of these campaigns were finding the marching campsites and through their size doing a dot to dot um, of where these various campaigns took place. That's great, thank you. Pleasure, thank you. Graham and then Jacqueline and then I think that might might be the last question maybe. Um, Simon, I think you've just answered my question because okay. uh, I missed the beginning of the, the presentation. But I was, my question was, is this absence of evidence rather than evidence of absence? And I think you've just answered that. Then, well, I did, but I mean the the key thing here, and it's I, I, I don't I am plugging my book, but I'm not saying this to plug my book. The, the 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 there are varieties of disparate pieces of evidence, but nothing absolutely definitive. So you're always forced, in the case of this particular mystery, to form your own opinion by following the evidence trail as you see it. And me, it's Jacqueline. Um, you mentioned the origin, uh, investigating the origin of the London schools with a view to um, doing a television programme. Is that a long process or is that something that's done fairly quickly once the funds are available? Well, actually, what you're doing, you're examining the the, the teeth more than anything, because you can tell from the enamel and the soft and, and the, 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 the remains of the teeth where an individual grew up because it leaves a trace and it's actually it's like a sort of a layer cake going from, if it's Roman, a layer cake going from North Africa all the way through to the northern frontier. And where that person grew up, you can tell absolutely definitively um, where they've spent their formative years. So that will tell you where the person certainly was born and then grew up, up to the age of about sort of um, 11 or 12. And, and that process actually isn't particularly onerous, providing you've got the financial resource to do it. So the key trick with this particular programme is actually to get a broadcaster to fund the scientific re research up front, which is the reason I'm actually teaming up with a production company, because it's almost like pitching for a sort of a National Lottery Heritage Fund or something like that. Great question, though. Great question. Um, so I, I think we'd, we're just oh, just down to the last uh, question. I, 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 there's one in the chat asking about the the film portrayals, so uh, the Centurion and and the 
and the eagle. Uh, 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 how, I mean, how fair are they in terms of pictures of what a, of the Roman legionaries would have kind of looked like? And actually, I quite like the, the eagle. I, I mean, they're, they're both okay. Actually, I think the the, the centurion goes off piste in terms of the Ninth Legion story, and Rosemary Sutcliffe. But the, the 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 eagle sticks very closely to Rosemary Sutcliffe's book. Um, and actually, the way that the the the, the warriors are kitted out, etc., is probably the most accurate representation you will see in any sort of Hollywood blockbuster. It's pretty accurate. The, certainly at the beginning, when you have Marcus in the the marching what's a marching camp, the the fort on the northern frontier where he he fights and he's injured. That's a very very accurate um, representation. And also psychologically, the way the mentality of the legionaries is portrayed, uh, what is effectively almost the Tolkien-esque, Game of Thrones-esque extremity of the Roman Empire is pretty accurate as well. So I I quite like the eagle, actually. Uh, Tom did have his hand up. So, Tom, if you're still here, please ask your question. Oh, oh uh, thank, thanks. Uh, thanks, Robert. Yeah, th thanks. This will be the last question, sorry. Thanks, thanks for a very interesting uh, talk. You mentioned that there were a number of other uh, sort of, uh, legions that were, were wiped out in the East on, under that particular hypothesis. But, I mean... It, is there evidence to suggest what those legions were if, if they weren't the Ninth Legion? I mean, are there other, other, other candidates that, uh, that might have been wiped out uh, in, in the Parthian War? Or there, 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 there is a legion which the historical record says was destroyed. So the difference is we don't know what happened to the Ninth Legion, but there is one legion which the historical record says was destroyed. We just don't know where. And that's Legio 21. It's got a very, very complicated cognome, which I'm not going to pronounce now, but Legio 21. So if I tell you that there was a legion we know destroyed in the Bar Kokhva revolt, 132-135, and we a legion definitively destroyed in 161 at the beginning of the Roman Parthian War, well, one of those two is going to be the um, Legio 21. Um, you could then argue that the Ninth Legion would be the candidate for the other one, except you've just got this big space of time if it's the, the Roman Parthian War. Right, well, I, I think time's time's run out, but um, thank you so much, Simon. I'm, I'm so sorry for all, all of the technical issues we had. We don't we don't normally have have so many people joining us at uh, whilst, whilst Whilst the talk is underway, so apologies again to everyone. Uh, the talk was recorded, so uh, I will be sending a, a link round to that. But uh, Simon, once again, uh, good luck with all all your future projects. It sounds like you're a busy man at the moment. Come and join me in Rome and Algeria in March with Andante Travels. Go to the go, go, go to the North African Limes. Okay, maybe. <laughs> All right. All the best, everyone. Have a good Christmas. Bye, everybody. Thanks Thank for having you. me. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.